there. In the meantime, we are going to continue with our virtual sermons uh, here on our Facebook uh, page. Feel free to share uh, those. You can connect with us through Facebook, through Instagram, and we also have an email. And if you want to sign up, there's uh, that church directory where you can get the email notifications as well. Um, we are also having a Wednesday uh, prayer meeting, and we continue to have our online Sabbath school uh, meetings through Zoom with the young adults. So we have links for those if you're interested or if you want specific prayer requests please uh, don't hesitate uh, to contact us. So uh, if you want to bow your hands with me, we're going to have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for uh, giving us that wonderful promise that you're going to be coming back a second time and that you're preparing a home for us in heaven and that in the meantime, you've sent your Holy Spirit to be with us regardless of the positive times or troubling times your Holy Spirit is always with us. I pray that the Holy Spirit can be with those who are going through specifically difficult times, loss of employment, uh, loss of housing, uh, and just all the anxiety and uncomfortableness with the, what's going on in the world. But we know that you're coming back again, and we look forward to that second coming so that we can be in heaven when there will be no more suffering and no more pain. Uh, we thank you for the love that you have for us and for dying in the cross for everyone. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So today's scripture reading will be from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. The Lord has said to Abram, leave your native country your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. morning church family uh, it is good to be here although it's a little strange last week was really a highlight it was our first sabbath together uh, after about 13 weeks of being away so um, i am glad to be with you this morning but we're going to be doing it through virtually uh, sermon so i have a, one or two members here that are, uh, are here so i'm going to be um, preaching and speaking to you um, during our agape feast back in january which now seems like a really long time uh, so many things have happened since the beginning of January. Um, uh, I had mentioned uh, when we were having our agape feast about, um, touched on the fact that God is a covenantal God, um, that he is all about relationships, and he has righteous integrity in everything that he does. He is faithful. He is a God who makes and keeps promises. And um, this morning, I want to talk to you about the promises that God made, specifically through Abraham. And it is called the Everlasting Covenant. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Um, our Father in heaven, um, we gather wherever we are now, uh, in different locations, uh, different times that we are, will be seeing this. But Father, uh, we know that you are with us uh, no matter where we are. And we just want to praise your holy name. And as we gathered this morning to worship you and to just um, listen to your word. Um, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, to be in our hearts. Um, we thank you, Lord, that we are called your sons and daughters, and we pray for that restoration um, that you have promised. Uh, we ask for reformation of our hearts um, and transformation of our minds. Um, and so, Lord, I just pray that you would be with me, give me the words to speak, not my words, but yours. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. A few nights ago, um, I was uh, awakened. I was sound asleep, but I was awakened in the middle of the night uh, this week uh, by the sound of crying. Uh, my daughter was crying in the middle of the night. And at first I thought, you know, maybe I'm dreaming. It's, it, it's a dream. I'm having a dream. But as all parents will know, you recognize the sound of your children crying, especially at night. It was just something that you, you, you're just attuned to. And so I awoke up and I said, well, uh, 
um, that sounds like Emma crying. So I, so I went to her bedroom um, and I noticed uh, her silhouette in the, in the darkness uh, uh, of, of the room. I kind of stumbled uh, there to, to get to her. And um, she, was, she, was cl she was crying um, and I put my hand around her and I, I said, you know, what's the matter? Are you, do you have some pain or, you know, are you hurting? Um, and she was just crying and, and really not uh, responding. So it was just kind of silence. Um, but I just kind of held her, right? You know, in, in those times, you know, you just want to be held. So I just, so I just held her and, um, you know, I was still kind of waking up. Um, and, and I was asking, you know, what, what's the matter, sweetie? What, what, what's wrong? And then, you know, through her, you know, tears, which seemed like an eternity, just kind of waiting, she finally blurts out and she says, why is there so much hatred in the world? And, you know, I, and so, you know, I was kind of, again, half asleep, but, but hearing those words, why is there so much hurting? Why is there so much hatred in the world? I um, realized um, the gravity of the question she was asking. Um, I, I realized that these haunting words are not new words. Uh, these are words that have echoed throughout history of uh, mankind. Why is there so much hurting? Why is there so much pain? Um, these, these words have existed um, and have echoed through, throughout history. Uh, so it was nothing new that she was saying. Um, but for her, it was something very palpable that she was feeling that evening. And, um, you know, I don't care whether you're an atheist or agnostic or whoever, when you see injustice, when you see things happening, you know that things are wrong, that they're not right. You, you react to them. You have a visceral reaction inside you. You know when things are wrong, when, when things are not going right. And as she had exclaimed this, I, um, I, I kind of just, you know, held her. Um, and I couldn't pretend like what she was saying was not happening or not meaningful in any way, um, because it was. Um, I could not dispute the facts that my 15-year-old daughter was exclaiming as she, you know, really realized the uh, profundity and hopelessness of a world around her where people act and do terrible things. They, they say uh, terrible things to one another. They treat each other badly, um, even, in among, uh, even among family members. It's, it's the world that we live in, a world beset with sin. And so I just held her and I said, I know, sweetie, I, 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 I know. And uh, it is a terrible world. But I said, you know, this is why Jesus will come again. And I said, this is, um, uh, he's going to come again and he's going to restore all things to establish his kingdom, and, which is a kingdom of love and righteousness. And, 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 I could, and I could say this, and as I wiped away the tears from her eyes and, and just kind of calmed her down and held her there, um, we just kind of spent the night, I kind of laid with her for a little bit until she was comforted. But I know that my wiping of her tears was just temporary. I knew that it probably would happen again some other time, some other disappointment, because it is the world that we live in. It is a world of disappointment and sin. And it is with this backdrop that I want to share with you this morning, church family, um, a message of hope and a message of grace. And it is this message of this everlasting covenant that God made with Abraham. Um, uh, I want to quote from you from uh, E.G. White, um, both found in the book Faith um, uh, I Live By. And, and these are very quote, short quotes. It says, the only means of salvation is provided under the Abrahamic covenant. And in another place she writes, the covenant of grace is not a new truth, for it existed in the mind of God from all eternity. This is why it is called the everlasting covenant. So from the very beginning, the eternal Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God, who were based on relationship, God said, let us make man, this same God who said, let us make man who created all things, he conceived, before he created the world, he conceived this idea of how he was going to deal with the inevitableness of creating free human agents. And for God, if God is love, in order for love to truly exist, there has to be freedom. And if there is freedom, there has to be a risk involved with freedom. Because love is not forced. Love is not a tyrannical thing. Love is free. Freely to be given and freely to receive. 
And so this God had a plan from the very beginning. John tells us that God is love. He didn't say that God is loving as an adjective or um, as uh, a way of being that, you know, I am loving. No, he says that God, by his very nature, the God that we serve is a God of love. So what does that, what does that mean? So we know that um, this God who is love created beings, uh, both uh, our parents, Adam and Eve, but also the heavenly angels that he created. He created them with to be free. And so this freedom, this uh, freedom that had to exist, had to be um, free. It had to be let um, to, to nourish and to, to flourish. But there was a deception, there was rebellion. We know there was a war in heaven uh, that we read about in Revelation, that there was war in heaven. And so it didn't start here on earth, but it started in heaven, this war that took place. So the question today is, same question that my daughter asked, why is there so much hatred? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much suffering in the world if there is a God of, who is love? And Paul, in his love chapter, in um, chapter uh, 13, verse 4 through 8, um, Paul d defines and he says, this is what love is, right? And he says, love is patient. You know, love is kind. But what, what, is, what is it if we were to take the word love and just exchange the word God for it and read the verse that way? So I'll do that for you right now. God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not boast. God is not proud. God does not dishonor, dishonor others. God is not self-seeking. God is not easily angered. God keeps no records of wrongs. God always protects. God always trusts. God always hopes. God always perseveres. And God never fails. In other words, God, we can trust him. He is faithful and he does what he says he will do. For many years, I used to approach reading uh, the scriptures uh, kind of like a textbook. Um, reading the 66 books that are in the Bible. Um, you could read various books, prophets, the Psalms, um, these various letters, and, and you could read them as a textbook. Um, isolated chapters, uh, but they all kind of tie together, telling this wonderful story of salvation, where God is the hero in this story. But lately, I've been um, intrigued about reading and looking at Scripture in a different way. And I invite you to look at scripture, not in a way that we have all these books as a textbook that we can kind of go through, but as a narrative story, a story that tells um, how God deals with um, the problems that we see in this world. And so this experience with my daughter just got me thinking, it's like, what, you know, what was I going to talk about? But it fits so well with this idea of scripture being a narrative. Um, and so I think because of that, it's important to start at the very beginning. And um, I invite you to uh, look at the book of Genesis. Um, Genesis is not an, it's an important book, not only because it is the first book uh, of, of the Bible, um, and it's, uh, Genesis means origins, um, but it's important because it's an accurate history um, of a historical narrative um, that we see and it's vital to our understanding of God and who God is. The first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, um, it seems like Moses, when he wrote, uh, wrote it, was really taking 2,000 years of history and condensing it all down into the first 11 chapters. And, and Abraham, I mean, and, and, and then he goes and talks about Abraham in chapter 12. But the first 11 chapters um, cover a pretty wide period of time uh, roughly about 2,000 years, whereas the chapters 12 through 50, the remaining 38 chapters, um, it looks like he takes, and it's now looking at maybe 300 years of, uh, of history, uh, and in fact, um, it's really looking at Abraham and his family uh, in, the, in the rest of the book of Genesis um, that, that we, we talk about and we look at. Um, and that's something that you know, we wanna kinda just explore with you this morning. 
I don't know if you ever had an essay problem in school or uh, when your teachers, you know, maybe only gave you two or three problems. Uh, and there were very simple questions, but yet each one took a long time to write the answer. And so you had maybe a page or two for each of those questions. Um, I didn't really like taking essay questions, but I remember in history, um, it was you know typical for history lesson uh, history classes that you know they would pose a question, and you had to write and you had to write and you had to do that, and and I kind of look at that's kind of the same way um, of scripture is that the first eleven chapters, Moses sets out and sets the context of what the issues and the problems of the uh, uh, that we have in our world, and then. From chapter 12 on to the rest is how God answers that question that Moses raises. Um, and so we'll share that and we'll go through that uh, with you this, this morning. So as an overview, um, let's look at the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And this is just kind of, I'm going to go broad. Um, but chapter 1, we talk about the history of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Um, And the Lord proclaimed after each day of creation, he said that it was good. And on the last day, he says it was very good as he observed what he had created. So God, here we get a picture of God that what he does, he does it to a level of excellence. He does it and it's very good. In chapter 2, it talks about life in God's garden. And God instructs Adam and Eve. And he says, out of all the trees in the garden, you may eat except for one. So we see here a picture of God, of a God of abundance, a God of generosity. And, and, and so, so we see that um, uh, in, in chapter 2. In chapter 3, it talks about the fall of man. Man falls into sin. He disobeys. Um, he is separated from God. He loses his connection. He feels like he is naked. He runs from God. He hides uh, to, and he covers um, his nakedness and his shame. Um, and this is just emblematic of what's taken place, which is this vertical separation that has happened now between God and man. This alienation that takes place, this vertical separation that took place. Uh, we see that right there in the garden. But God makes a promise in the garden. In Genesis 3, verse 15, he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and I will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. In chapter 4, we see the vertical alienation is quickly followed by horizontal alienation. We hear that we see the story of Cain and how he murdered Abel. First, what happens is vertical separation, separation from God. Then immediately what follows is this horizontal separation amongst one another. And you have um, hatred, alienation. This, this relationship has been broken vertically and now horizontally as well. Chapter 5, the family of Adam, the genealogy, and the length of time that man lived on the earth. And then chapter 6, we see the wickedness of men. In chapter 6, verse 5 through 6, says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of human race had become on the earth, and, the very, the, uh, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil at the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. Chapter 7 is the flood. The earth and its inhabitants were destroyed, and only Noah and his family uh, were saved. Chapter 8 talks about Noah's deliverance and God's care for him. Chapter 9 talks about God making a covenant with Noah and creation um, and restarting all over again. And if you look at it closely, there's a close parallel between Noah and the world after the flood and the creation story. It almost repeats. It's like creation 2.0. God starts all over again. Chapter 10, Noah's descendants. Chapter 11, we get to the Tower of Babel. Man has one language, one culture, and they want to make a name for themselves and build a tower because they do not believe or trust in the God and his promises that he had made. And so God comes down and separates the languages, cultures, and nations because mankind is headed down a path that if they are allowed to go there would prevent him from fulfilling his plan for saving the world. And so we see here the furtherance of this horizontal separation that took place uh, in terms of culturally, linguistically, um, ethnically, there was a separation that, that took place. And so that's the world that we live in. 
That's the world that we recognize today. But we see here that Moses goes through very quickly all these events. 2,000 years of history, boom, boom, boom. From the creation to the Tower of Babel, all in 11 chapters, the first 11 chapters. And he paints a picture that is a very grim picture. The picture is, first God created and everything was good and beautiful, but then man sinned. Then man became alienated from God and separated. Then man became alienated from one another and further destruction of the world. Man's continual thoughts were only evil. And, and Moses paints a picture of a very glim uh, place. The fundamental pro problem that Moses outlines is that vertical alienation that started in Eden with the sin problem. And then man hid himself. And then it led to horizontal alienation with Cain killing Abel. And later, further horizontal alienation in the Tower of Babel. And he, you, can, you can summarize these 11 chapters in, there was creation, there was a fall, there was a flood, and there was a tower. Those are the, the first uh, four pieces that uh, we see here at the beginning of Genesis. But the key thing is that humans have become alienated from God, and they are alienated from one another. Like my daughter crying out, why is there so much hate in the world? It's the same thing Moses outlines. He kind of puts it out there and he says, well, this doesn't look good. This, the, the, we have a serious plot problem. And he, he sets it out very quickly in the first 11 chapters. So how will God fix the problem? And I think that that's kind of the intriguing story. So Moses sets up the problem. First 11 chapters says, this is the problem. This is the world that, that we have. This is what we've been given. And then we get to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, the pace of all Genesis changes because the focus is now on this story about Abraham. And it's about a story of how God makes a promise. And so uh, as um, Nassim read for us in uh, Genesis chapter 12, 1 through uh, 3, he, he read uh, this narrative story of God coming down and talking to Abraham. Um, and this verse begins to address and answer the question that Moses set out. Why is there so much pain in the world? How are you going to fix this problem, God? And it might have seemed maybe funny to the angels looking down that God says, I have an answer. I'm going to do it to this old guy here named Abraham and Sarah. And through them, I am going to fulfill and save the world and restore all things. And they must have looked at him and, you know, Abraham, really, that, that guy, that old, old guy? He wasn't young. He wasn't in the fit of strength. But he pointed to Abraham as Abraham, through him, was how God was going to fulfill and answer the question that is set forth by, by Moses. And the question that we, uh, of alienation, at the root of it is the question is, is God really who he claims to be? Is God really love? Can we trust God? Is it good news that there is a God? And if he looks like Jesus, maybe that is really good news. So the promise to Abraham that in chapter 12, 1 through 3, there was creation, there was conflict, and then God makes a covenant. And that's what we're going to talk about this moment, that God Another word for covenant is just a promise. God makes a promise. So uh, I'm going to read it through. Uh, this is from uh, the New King James Version. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So how is it that this promise, this, this covenant that God makes with Abraham, is the answer to these previous 11 chapters that are uh, in Genesis? Notice the following things. The proclamation to restore the, uh, the answer to the sin problem starts with God making a promise to Abraham. And that we have the following words. He says, get out, or come out of your country, Abraham. 
separate yourself from your country and your, your familial gods, your family, and leave this place. Leave the place that you find yourself in. Start over. To me, when I first read it, this call sounds very familiar to Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, where he says, And I heard a voice uh, from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest she share in her sins, unless you receive of her plagues. The call to come out of Babylon, to come out of confusion, to come out to know the true God, is an invitation to fellowship. It's an invitation to reconnect with God. And like God's call to Abraham, it is a call to a better place, a better way of life. It is a call that God always puts us in a place that is better than we ever were before because God's character is good. Notice that this covenant that God makes is very one-sided. It's not like, Abraham, I'm going to do this, but you have to do this. It's God's covenant with Abraham is all one-sided. It's a promise for a better land, a better place. He says, I will show you. I will make you. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And because God will do these things and enter into a relationship with you, you will be a blessing to others. God blessings are never meant to be held on tight just to, uh, for us. They're never meant to be uh, limited or parochial. Uh, God's blessings uh, are not of exclusivity uh, for any group, not even, you know, uh, Abraham here. It wasn't just for the Jews. It was for everyone. God's promises of blessings are not to be selfishly clinged to. God's blessings are always meant to be shared because we serve a God who is love. Love for all, not only um, all mankind, but also all of creation as well. Once that vertical relationship is established and re-engaged with God, he promises to bless those uh, around us who bless us, and to curse those who curse us. The promise of God is to restore our relationship with one another. And the promise of God is to, as he restores these relationships, is to break away these social isolation that, uh, that we have with society or looking at others as different groups, different than us. His promise is to restore us to be one with, through Jesus Christ, to be one through, through him. And finally, the climax of the promise is that he says that all the families of the earth shall be blessed through Abraham's seed. Not only men, not just one group, but all the families of the earth. I love that God goes back to restore the broken world and rightfully connects and reminds us that we are all sons and daughters of God, that we are all one family. We are all part of God's family whether we're black, yellow, red, white, it doesn't matter. For God, we are his creation. We are all his sons and daughters. Our differences are done away with in Jesus and in that promise that he made to Abraham. So God's answer was to say, through this old guy, through this guy named Abram, through this couple, I will send my son. Through the story of Abraham, I will demonstrate to the world and to the unfallen worlds and to all the universe, I will demonstrate my love for them. It is um, said in uh, Isaiah 44, uh, it said that uh, uh, Abraham was God's friend. He says, but you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Jesus, in the New Testament, exclaiming, um, talking about love, he mentions in John 15, 13, says, Great love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. And Abraham was God's friend. In the story of Abraham, we see God's everlasting covenant being demonstrated. There was no angel there to hold back the hand of God when he provided the sacrifice. Abraham, by faith, said, God will provide. And in that thicket, that ram that was stuck there, in that thicket representing Jesus, God provided that sacrifice. Jesus Christ came to die for each one of us, for the whole world, not just for one group. He died for the whole world. And that's the good news of the, mess of the gospel, is that we are saved by grace 
by believing in the sacrifice that God provided for us. That is good news. It is good news that's worth telling and sharing with others. In Genesis 17:7, it says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. The same covenant was answered to Abraham in the promise, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That promise pointed to Jesus. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and he said, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be perfect. The testimony of God concerning his faithful servant was, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my, kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. This Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ and it is called the second or the new covenant because the blood of which was sealed was shed after that first covenant was made. There is hope for us today because of that promise that God made to Abraham about that seed, about Jesus coming. That, in essence, is the hope that we have today for what Jesus has done, that God kept his promise and didn't hold back his son, but gave him freely. The gospel that was preached to Abraham through which we have hope is the same gospel that is preached today. And Abraham looked unto Jesus, who was the author and finisher of his faith. Jesus showed us the broad plan of salvation was for the whole world, not just for the physical descendants of Abraham, but for all who would believe like Abraham did. That's why Abraham is called the father of all believers. Jesus mentioned that when we are in heaven, that many will come to seek Abraham out. Matthew 8, 11 says, And I say unto you that, Many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. When the command was given to Abraham to offer his son, all heavenly beings with intense earnestness watched each step in the fulfillment of this command. Light was shed upon the mystery of redemption and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provisions that God had made for man's salvation. This is uh, from page 97 of From Eternity Past. I am sure it's not just my 15-year-old uh, that sorrows for the condition of the world today. I'm sure that there are enough tears that have been shed to fill an ocean. Adam and Eve cried when they saw the first uh, flowers, petals fall from uh, a flower. The results of sin, I'm sure that they wept and they witnessed death and decay from this physical world, but also they also witnessed the moral decay within. We know that the Father is not willing that any should perish, but he says that he's willing that all should come to repentance. How about us? Are we saddened to tears by the chaos and the turmoil that we see and the pain and grief uh, that we see in this world for the injustices and the wickedness that is around us? Do we cry for those souls that don't have hope, that don't know about the love of God? Love cannot force, and love cannot dictate, but love requires freedom and risk, as was mentioned. But love needs to be demonstrated by actions. That's what Abraham did. He demonstrated his love by obedience. How do we demonstrate love that fills and shows it to those around us? I would like to suggest that the restoration that God promises, that transformation, is not something that we wait for till we get to heaven, but it's something that starts now, that starts in our hearts, that starts by having the living Christ living within us, by having God's Spirit filling us, by showing that we are his sons and daughters, by how we treat one another. After all, Jesus said that we will, the world will know that we are his disciples by how we treat one another by the love that we show for one another. Like Abraham, once we receive that gift of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, that vertical connection starts to be strengthened and flourish, relying on the Holy Spirit. And then our horizontal relationships will be restored. Then 
our connections with one another will be strengthened. We will do it out of love, compelled um, by love. And like Abraham, we can live our lives amidst a chaotic, chaotic, chaotic world, knowing that God is a God that keeps his word because he is faithful in keeping promises. In closing, I want to look at Revelation chapter 21. And I want to read to you verses 1 through 7. And it says, Now I saw the new earth, the new heaven, and the new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, no more, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of waters of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is the promises that we have from God. And just like the promise that he made to Abraham and he kept, we can be sure that that promise at the end of the book, from the very beginning but now to the revelation, we can trust God's promise that he will fulfill what he said in his word. I look forward to that day when our cries and our tears, our sorrow will be done away with and the anguish of my daughter will finally be done away with because it will not be me wiping her tears, but it will be God himself wiping those tears. His promise is to wipe away all our tears, your tears also. So I look forward to that day. May God bless you. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your blessings. We give you thanks for your word and for your promises that you make because you are faithful. You keep your words. You have integrity and character, and you are a God of love. And we can, we can count on you, and we can count on your words of love and protection for us. So, Father, we just ask that you would bless everyone who hears my words today, that you would uh, fill them with your spirit, and that you would come soon, Lord. Um, that you would come soon, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.